Hi everyone, and welcome to a discussion about court hierarchy and structure, and why this is a really important part of any legal research. So in this PowerPoint, I'm going to talk about why this is important for legal writing. I'm also going to review the court hierarchies and structures and what I like to call the triangles for both the Massachusetts state courts and the appellate courts, but understanding that every state court system also has a similar structure and hierarchy. And in doing so, we will also review the differences between the trial court and the appellate courts. So at first, a little bit about why this is important. Legal writing, it necessarily requires understanding of how court decisions are written. This is one of the major building blocks of putting together any type of legal analysis, really begins with understanding jurisdiction and understanding why we read court cases. So in legal research and writing one and two, we tend to spend a lot of time practicing reading court decisions. We're learning about the facts of the case that we're reading. We learn about the history, the procedural history. And then we also learn about whatever that legal issue or issues are that are on appeal that the court is deciding. And then of course, the rationale and decision, what the court held. And the reason that is really important is because we read existing court decisions as precedent, which means those cases are guides for us as to how our own client matters are going to be resolved. So understanding how prior courts cases are written, how the courts have conducted their analysis helps us in using those prior cases as precedent. So now we're going to move into talking about not just any court case, but finding court cases that are pertinent and relevant to our client's case. And I don't have it on this slide, but I want you to imagine that you have your client's set of facts over here. Whatever the story is, whatever the events that transpired that happened to your client, maybe a slip and fall in the grocery store, maybe you know didn't get a promotion at work, whatever the issue is. And then you need to help do some research to figure out how your client's case is going to be resolved, or maybe you're writing a motion on behalf of your client. To do that, we have to do the research over here to that existing precedent. And you might have realized that there's nearly an infinite amount of precedent out there. There's thousands of cases from every jurisdiction, all 50 states and the federal court system all over the United States. And do we want to research all of those? Of course not. We want to narrow it down. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, in what jurisdiction is my client's case? Where is my client's case currently happening? So is it a state court case or is it a federal court case? And that is something that you may know on your own. It may be something that the attorney tells you. And if you don't know, then you do need to ask because it matters to what research we're going to be doing. So the first thing we want to know is, what jurisdiction is my client in? And so is it in state or federal? Once we know if the client's case is in state or federal, we also want to ask what level court is our client's case in? And I'll show you that in just a minute with some triangles. But what I mean is, is our, is our client's case currently pending before the trial court in our jurisdiction? Or has a trial been resolved or a summary judgment decision happened and now our client's case is up on appeal to, let's say, the Supreme Judicial Court? Or if we're in federal court, it's the same question applies. Is our client's case at the trial court level or is our client's case on an appellate level? And before we do any research into our client's case, we need to know where is our client today? The reason we need to know that is when we go to do our research, we want to be looking for this word here, mandatory authority in our jurisdiction. So if we have a client's case here at the Superior Court of Suffolk County in Massachusetts, do we want to be looking at California state cases to tell us the likely outcome of our case? You can probably imagine not because California is a completely different jurisdiction, and that's true. So we want to stay focused on the cases that are in our jurisdiction when we do our research, and we want to look for cases that are at a higher level in those triangles. So I'm going to go through that in a little bit more detail, but I wanted to set the groundwork here as to why it's really important to understand how to read court cases and also understand the jurisdiction of your client and the cases that you are reading. 
Okay, so just a little background. I do think it's really important for us before we leave a paralegal program to have a really good comprehension of the difference between the trial courts and the appellate courts. So for both federal and state jurisdictions, we have trial courts and we have appellate courts. So as you're driving around town and you see a courthouse building, that court inside of it will either be a trial court or it will be an appellate court. It may be a building that houses both, but there's different courts in there. And I'm going to review the major differences between the two. Hopefully this is not the first time you've heard it, but feel free to refer back to this video if you want some additional guidance. The trial court is what we call the lowest level of the triangle. So I'll actually go through, actually, let me pause this and I'm going to show you one of the triangles and I've also put it on Blackboard for you, but let me pull it up. Okay, here are my triangles. I do really like to draw these and when I have classes in person, I do like to draw them on the whiteboard, but this will do just fine and now you can keep a copy of it. So this is what I mean by a triangle and by a hierarchy. So here's Massachusetts labeled here, and here's the federal hierarchies. At the bottom level of any triangle, of any court hierarchy, are the trial courts. So it doesn't say trial here, but I've labeled them as to what the courts are called. The trial court is the lowest level of the court system, of any system that you're in, and every court has a trial court in it, any court system. And this is where the trial begins. So if we go back to the other slide, which I'll go to in a minute, the trial court contains one judge. This person presides over the trial, make sure courtroom decorum is being followed, make sure the right witnesses are able to speak and the evidence is introduced properly. There is a one single judge presiding over the trial. During the trial court, and again, during the trial, this is an opportunity for the plaintiff in their case to introduce live, to introduce any evidence they have. So plaintiffs and defendants can introduce live witness testimony. They can introduce documents and exhibits. They can take a piece of paper and say, is this your signature on this document? They can blow up photographs for the jury to see. So there's a very, it's a very active court with a lot happening in terms of witnesses and evidence. There's also a jury in addition to the judge. The jury act as the fact finders. Now, we, there is something also called a bench trial where a jury does not act as the fact finder and the judge also acts as a fact finder. And so the judge carries both roles. But the jury only exists here in that lowest level trial court. So one judge presiding over the trial the opportunity for both parties to introduce live to witness testimony and other evidence, and then a jury acting as the fact finder for the decision. And at the end or the close of the trial, the jury will reach a verdict and will enter judgment for either the plaintiff or the defendant or in a criminal case for the government or the defendant. And then that stage of the case is concluded when judgment is entered. And I've labeled the names of the courts here. I think it's critically important that you know the courts in Massachusetts and you know the names of the federal courts and you know the names of the courts in any jurisdiction where you regularly practice. So if you're not in Massachusetts, if you're in another state, make sure you know the names of those courts as well. So um, let me just go back to the PowerPoint just for a second so we can look at that together. So I've labeled here again, the characteristics of the trial court, one judge, a jury, and then live evidence, testimony, and the outcome is judgment for a plaintiff or defendant. The appellate courts are the ones, once you move up that triangle, once you move up, there's not an obligation for a party to appeal their case. That's usually up to the outcome and the finances available. But should the losing party decide to appeal the case, we then move from that lowest level trial court into the appellate courts. Now, the appellate courts is everything that's not a trial court. So you can have more than one level of appellate courts. In the federal court system, which I'll go back to that side in just a second, there's both in, in Massachusetts too, for that matter, there is an intermediate level of appeal followed by a highest level of appeal. So there's a first stop in the middle. And then if you'd like, you can attempt to take a further appeal to the highest court for that jurisdiction. So it's not just um, it, the appellate court can contain more than one level. Some estates are smaller and they don't have an intermediate court level. There's not a, a middle stopping ground. You go right up to the state's highest court. But before I go back to those triangles and those hierarchies, let's just 
outline the characteristics of the appellate court as compared to the trial court. So one major difference is the number of judges. At the trial court level, there's only that one single judge who's presiding over the trial. However, at the appellate court, there's a panel of judges. And that is because the purpose of the appeals court is to determine whether there were errors made in the lower court, that is the trial court. So when a case goes up on appeal and a losing party, whoever did not get the outcome they wanted, when they choose to take their appeal to the appellate court, what they're saying to the appellate court is, hey, appellate court, this trial court made a mistake or maybe multiple mistakes. Maybe the trial judge allowed evidence to come in that shouldn't have been. Maybe the trial judge um, you know, gave incorrect jury instructions according to the law. And the appellate court doesn't have a jury anymore, doesn't ask for witnesses to come back live in front of them, and doesn't go back and say, let's have another trial. But what they say is, we're going to look at all the paper, we're going to look at all the evidence, and we as a panel of judges, which is an odd number of judges, are we're going to review everything that happened in the trial court, and then we will make a decision as to whether there's been an error of law in the trial court. So the panel of judges is always an odd number. Very often in an intermediate level court in state court, it can be three judges. How many judges sit on the Supreme Judicial Court is seven. And how many judges sit on the United States Supreme Court is nine. And that is because you need to reach an outcome. You can't have an even split. So that's the major differences between trial court and appellate court. So if you're ever called for jury duty, you'll never be called to an appellate court. You would always be called to serve on the jury of a trial court. Now, the trial court could be state or federal, but that is where the jury sits. Okay, let me pause and go back to the triangles so we can label those court names and you can be sure that you have them down. Okay, back to the triangles. By the way, I see this video is going to be slightly more than the 15 minutes, so I'll have to continue it on video number two for a short period. So here's what we were just talking about. The lower courts here, these are your trial courts. And these are, again, the single judge and the jury and the fact finders. Once you move up on appeal, you move up the triangle to the very top, and there's only one highest court that is the highest court for that jurisdiction. So I think it's really critical to know the names of the courts. And that is because we want to avoid confusion. And as I mentioned before, we always want to know where is my client? So you see it ties back to understanding why this is important to our research. So you might be thinking, why are we going off on this tangent of courts? It's because before we begin any research for our client, we have to figure out where in the, in the triangle, where in the hierarchy is our client. So the lowest court in Massachusetts, the trial court system in Massachusetts, has two different names because we have two different sets of trial courts. We have trial courts that are the superior court system, and these are organized by county in Massachusetts. We also have district courts. Whether your case in trial court belongs in district court or superior court is subject to really critical jurisdiction rules, and you will definitely talk to your attorney about the proper court to file a case. The short, really easy one to remember is that for civil cases, to be in superior court, you, the amount in controversy needs to be over $50,000 but a number of cases belong in district court and criminal court has their own jurisdiction breakdown as well. On the federal side, the federal side, the U.S. District Court is the name of the trial court. Now this is really important because the way the federal system is organized, there is at least one district court in every state. There's at least one federal district court in every state, but because some states have a very high population, some states have more than one U.S. district court in it. So states like Florida, Texas, California, New York, these states have more than one U.S. district court. How many are in Massachusetts? It's actually just one. We have one U.S. district court, and the name of it is the U.S. district court for the District of Massachusetts, and it's located right in downtown Boston. Now, the important piece to remember is notice that's called a U.S. district court, but we also have state district courts. So it goes back to, again, why it's really important to know exactly the court where your client is. If someone just says district court, you might say, well, do you mean federal U.S. district court or do you mean state district court? 
Let me pause the video here and I'll see you on video number two.